So welcome this morning. Welcome to uh, the teaching of God's Word. Again, I apologize. Uh, we may be able to get the U version up and running. Uh, I'll take full responsibility for why that didn't happen today. It was put in my hands to hit the, the to hit the word publish, and I didn't do it. And so I did it, but I didn't quite do it on time, so I learned some things. So anyway, this is the old-fashioned way, right, for you, you who are electronically dependent. Uh, this is uh, just, I'm just going to pray the Holy Spirit works anyway today. Is that okay? You ready for that? Absolutely, absolutely. So I just want to begin with a story. Um, first of all, RSVP, it's a big deal, right? That Jesus Christ is calling us to belong, right? Calling us to belong to him. Calling us to say, yes, I'll come. Yes, I'll show up. Um, it's the RSVP, you know, is uh, four letters for the, for, the, for the French, which means, we had some people pronounce it in French last week, but which simply means, you know, please respond. I mean, is that too much to ask? Please respond, right? I don't know about you, but when you talk to your kids, you like a little bit of response, right? Just something. Something that indicates life somewhere. When they talk to you, they would like response as well, right? Not just so busy that you don't even see them. They, you, they would like response. God loves response. Sometimes we talk about responsibility, but I like to think of it in terms of response ability. The grace of God gives us the ability to respond to him. So sometimes we are called to respond in times that's really, at times that are really, really hard. Times are quite difficult when we uh, first received uh, years ago our invitation to pastor a church in southern Idaho uh, we had never been to Idaho and our visions of Idaho were lush green beautiful amazing just like mountains and trees and streams and lakes everywhere in the state of Idaho so we were going to go to a little place called Burley Idaho but there was not internet Chamber of Commerce didn't send out a lot of stuff, although some. And uh, maybe somebody would send you a picture, maybe not. And whenever you went to pastor a church, you didn't go visit that church first to see if you liked it. You just talked on the phone, exchanged some letters, and prayed about it, and depended upon God to help you know what to do. It's not a bad deal, right? So uh, we went. So we we went to Idaho, and I thought, I looked on the map. I just looked on the map. You know when you look on a map, and you say, and it's Idaho, and it says, I mean, just like a map, and it said Twin Falls. That sounds like gorgeous, right? And then Mountain Home. Mountain Home. I just thought, it's got to be just gorgeous. And about 30 miles outside of this little town called Burley, Idaho, I realized that there were absolutely only, shre only you know, sagebrush. And then I began, like, to panic. No, I began to cry inside of me. I could, God, I need in the next 30 miles for you to produce a massive forest with trees and waterfalls. <laughs> and guess what? He didn't do it. <laughs> See, not all my prayers are answered either, right? He didn't do it. So we got there, and we, we began to pastor in a little church of about 25 or 30 people. And... Um, it was really hard. It was really hard. It was hard on us, you know. We just had our first baby. Uh, Lynette was going through some postpartum stuff, and we were all going through our, we were learning how to be married and how to have a baby, you know, which you, everybody knows that's pretty easy, right? There's a, have you read the book, the manual on that one, right? And so we go through that, and then, and then we had like, it seemed like, you know, every, every time we got invited over, after a couple of years, every time we got invited over to somebody's house for dinner, uh, they ended up by saying, well, we wanted to have you here so we could tell you that we are leaving, right? They were moving. They were leaving, you know? You called us for dinner to tell us you were leaving, you know? Uh, but that began to happen over and over again. At one point, we had like, we were in kind of a, another religion dominated the area. And so at one point, seriously, in the night, we heard this commotion in our front yard. And we looked out, you know, a little bit the window. And there were all these car lights facing our house, kind of on toward our lawn and everything. And then we heard some, a megaphone. And we went upstairs. We opened the door slightly so we could hear. And the megaphone said, you are a false prophet, and your church is the wrong church. Scared Lynette just a little bit. I went down, got the shotgun. No, not really. <laughs> All I'm saying was, right, and, and listen, I want to tell you, this is exactly how I envisioned it turning out. Not at all. 
at our district gathering of churches, we were what was called a home mission church. At our district gathering of churches, uh, when, when we came together, you know, for a big event of all the leaders, all the churches and the leaders of the churches, they had what was called a home mission church night. And we were a home mission, which means that we got support from the district. And I think our salary was uh, combined with the, what the district could do was about $125 a week. And so uh, we were very grateful for that. And so anyway, but at this particular meeting, they said all, they made this literal announcement, all but one of our home mission churches is doing really well. It was glorious. It was, no, it was painful. There, it was a time of, of losses. It was a time, of, I'm a young pastor. I'm like, I have vision, I have hope, you know. And then all of this happens. And then you're faced with basic soul questions, right? Is this worth it? Is this worth it? I felt like I was in a God-forsaken place. Except that last Advent, right, we were learning that there are no God-forsaken places because God has entered every forsaken place, right? But you know how you can feel, right? You can feel that way in your marriage. You can feel that way in, in, in just in your life in general. You can feel like isolated. You can, and you can move when things like that happen. You can sink more deeply into yourself. Kind of close the walls around you. And, um, and just, you know, kind of muddle around in all of that disappointment question is was it worth it right you know we can feel that way in so many areas of our lives you know why follow Jesus why persevere or 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 if we decide to well how do we persevere we're going to be reading a scripture moment where Paul talks about how he is suffering as a, a for for being a follower of Christ so there's, there's suffering that comes because you are a follower of Christ. Now, that's happening in places across our world that um, people, you know, they, they pay a price for, for saying that they worship the Lord, Jesus Christ. Um, we, don't, we don't suffer that much here, actually. Uh, a lot of the suffering that we do here can be because, you know, the church doesn't have a very good reputation, you know, or... Because we, we haven't been very loving people, you know. We find people that are standing up for, you know, what is, what, me, what is right on the one hand, but they don't do it in a, in a, in a truly a godly, Christ-centered way, you know. So, you know, sometimes there can be suffering for the gospel here. Sometimes we just suffer as believers. So if you are a follower of Christ and you are suffering, sometimes you suffer for being a believer, although it's not that often here and probably... You know, there's a lot of reasons for that. But all of us suffer as followers. I mean, we're followers of Christ, and we have sufferings, right? We have difficulty. We have trial just because we're in this life, right? I mean, if you have, if you have marriage problems, welcome to, welcome to life, right? If you, if you have sickness that comes, welcome to life. If you, have, if you lose a job or if you have a, a, a career issue or, or you have, you know, a, a, a housing issue, a home issue, you know, and you have different things going on, I mean, life is, I mean, we, we are embedded in this world. We live in this world, and there is suffering that takes place. Now, what's interesting here is that many times when we're just in the midst of our own sufferings, we can begin to feel like, you know, well, where's God? What, what's up? Why, why doesn't, why don't things get better? Why can't things turn around? And indeed, many times they can absolutely turn around. But when you're in it, when you are in it, it can be really, really hard, can't it? So, I want to talk to you this morning from the Philippian letter about advancing the gospel in the midst of what's going on in your life, no matter what's going on, the good, the bad, the ugly, right? We are called to advance the good news of Jesus Christ with joy. The gospel of Jesus that we've been talking about, this good news about Christ, 
not only about what he did, but the good news of Jesus. Just like how Jesus brought good news into his world, the good news of Jesus is, for, is, is built for our real, ordinary, and challenging lives. So advancing the gospel in the midst of whatever the circumstances. The scripture we're going to read after, out of chapter 1, verses 12 through 14, which we read last week and talked a little bit about, is, just, uh, is, so, is so important. And remember, as Paul is writing, he's in prison. He's in prison for the faith as a follower of Jesus he is in prison now just wrap your head around that right he is in prison now he's experienced a lot of other things he's been beat up for the faith he's been you know gossiped about he's been considered an imposter he's he's been like he's gone through he's been homeless he's been hungry he's he's been through it all in his vocation as a follower of Jesus Christ. Okay? So at this point, he is in prison, and he writes these words. And I'm quoting from the voice translation. It says this, I have good news, brothers and sisters, and I want to share it. Now, I love that part. I have good news, and I want to share it. I, this whole impetus, right at the heart of what it means to be a follower of Christ is that we are, that, that, that the good news of Christ creates good news in us and that we have something that needs to be shared. And in his particular circumstances, he says, I have good news, brothers and sisters, and I want to share it. Believe it or not, my imprisonment has actually helped spread the good news to new places and populations. Believe it or not. This is like the most, this is a surprise, right? My imprisonment has actually helped spread the good news to new places and populations. I, I, just, I just love how he talks about all this. In fact, he goes on and says, Word is spread through the ranks of the imperial guard and to everyone else around me that I am in prison because of my faith in the anointed one, Jesus Christ. My imprisonment has instilled courage in most of our brothers and sisters so that they are trusting God more and have been even more daring as they speak the good news without fear. So this is so good. He is saying, I am experiencing Jesus in this circumstance, it is here that he is real. It is here that his grace is enough. It is here that he is working. This place, this prison, is the platform for advancing the good news of Jesus Christ through me. Now, who would have ever thought that? Right? Because he's not free now to roam and move around. His liberties are taken away. And he says, who would have ever thought? Believe it or not, this has become the place for the advancement of the good news of Jesus Christ. Word is being spread about that I'm here because of Christ, the anointed one. And my imprisonment has instilled courage in others so that they also are finding, you know, themselves more daring to speak about the good news without fear. I, I just love how he says that. He shares this gospel and he recognizes that this place this difficulty is the platform from which both to experience Jesus and from which to talk about Jesus. So, if you can just kind of integrate this a bit into your own life. They may not be in prison, right? I mean, evidently you're not. Because you're here. But there are different kinds of prisons. There are different kinds of difficulties. Sometimes we're suffering because we are followers of Christ. Sometimes we're just suffering. And as a follower of Christ, we may not say, well, I am suffering for Christ. But we may say, I am suffering. And in this suffering, Christ is with me. In other words, I am suffering with Christ in this. Christ enters into all of our sufferings. All of our struggles. All that goes wrong. All that renders us weak. Everything that would desire to leave us hopeless and create fear within us. In this present circumstance, we are to be experiencing Jesus in a lively way. Amen? In a lively way. 
So, so there's this issue then. How can we faithfully and missionally advance the strong love of Jesus Christ in these present circumstances? Where you are right now. So in order to get to this, there are several questions that I'm going to lay before you. The first question is this. If you want to learn how to move through this, really, I, I think we pick it up from the Apostle Paul here. What You have to answer this. What is your purpose in life? I mean, what is your purpose in life? You say, man, Dave, I just want to know how to make things better. You're making me think way too big here. But actually, this is very, very important to understand. What is your purpose in life as a follower of Jesus? All right? Now, this is assuming that you're not just a follower of Jesus on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock. But you're a follower of Jesus Monday, Tuesday, throughout the week. Right? Private times, public times. Easy times, hard times, all the time. And the question is, what is your purpose in life? Paul says in chapter 1, verse 1, as he writes, he self-identifies. He says, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. It's kind of like he's saying, no matter what happens, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. Jesus is not here to serve me. I'm here to serve Jesus. See, that flies in the face of American cultural Christianity a consumer Christianity that says, you know what? Invite Jesus into your life and see if he can't help your life become a better life as you envision your own life to be. But instead, it is, I am a servant of Jesus Christ. Jesus isn't my servant. Man, I've treated him like that in my prayers so many times. God, why aren't you doing this for me? You know? Hop, hop. Come on. You know? I'm sorry. I don't ever say it like that. It's totally my attitude. Why aren't you getting with this? You know I'm sincere. You know I'm desperate. You know I need you. Right? So anyway, I am a servant of Jesus Christ, he says. He says in chapter 1, verse 20, he says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Say that with me. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. Those are big words. I pray that I will in no way be ashamed, but I will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. What, what is his purpose in life? That Christ be exalted. That Christ be exalted. That Jesus be made much of, no matter what is going on, within his own life. Because, you see, he doesn't have to survive. For me to live as Christ, to die as gain. So he has a loose grip on life. He says, hey, for me to live as Christ, I want to live. And he, he says that. He kind of gives some of his own inner thinking here. He, but yeah, I want to live, but if I don't live, I just get more of Christ. So he says, to live as Christ, my life is about him. To die, it's more of Christ. So he's free as a servant of Jesus Christ. I don't have to survive. I belong to Christ. See, I love, I love, uh, ah, I love what's come out of. I'm so sorry for all of you who were Bears fans last Sunday, but uh, or or whatever weekend day it was last week. But the kicker, um, he uh, he he had the game-winning kick in view, and and he uh, he just. He just barely missed it. But a bear miss is a big miss. So Cody Parker missed the winning field goal for the Chicago Bears. And when he walked off the field, he went like this, which people do after they're successful. He walked off the field and went like this. And then gathered with a group of players in the middle of the field for a gather of prayer at the conclusion of the game while the fans were really giving it to him. 
There's a father who wrote about this and said, this is the man I want my sons to emulate. I want my sons, 9 and 11 years of, of age, he writes, to know about this man. Because this man is a man of character and a man of faith. Right? So, I mean, like, in the biggest moment of his young career, on national television, in front of fans who had paid, and, 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 and before all of the betting of much money in Las Vegas, this man misses the field goal. I think it was the next day or the day after, he is on the Today Show, and they interview him because they saw him as a person of character and asked him, how did he do this? How does he walk through this? Can you, so, you, you were so used for, uh, for people who are successful and everything going their way, you know, to be, to be uh, kind of elevated in society. I was just so pleased. He just humbly sat there. And he, he said, football is what I do, but it is not who I am. See, like he has like a fundamental purpose in life. Now, this is like, this is a, this is a huge deal. Uh, one of my favorite authors, Henry Nouwen, he, 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 writes, he writes about his own journey. And, and he, he, he was a man who struggled a great deal. And, and he, he said this, at issue, at, at issue is this question, to whom do I belong? To God or to the world? Many of my daily preoccupations suggest that I belong more to the world than to God. A little criticism makes me angry, and a little rejection makes me depressed. A little praise raises my spirits, and a little success excites me. It takes very little to raise me up or thrust me down. Often I am like a small boat on the ocean, completely at the mercy of its waves. And that, my friends, is the story of nearly all of us here to some degree or another. Am I right? It is true. So we have to keep, we have to learn, we have to be in training, we have to let the Holy Spirit like teach us what it means as followers of Christ to answer this question, what is my purpose in life? If you can answer that question, you will be amazed at how you can, how you can thrive with joy in the midst of the most difficult things that happen as you work through these things, right? All right, here's the next question. If you want to thrive, if we want to be able to like, be like in whatever prison and say, oh my goodness, I can't believe how God is showing up and I'm able to talk about him. Listen, the question is this, is Jesus enough? Is Jesus enough for you? Chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. For I have learned, he says, to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through Christ who gives me strength. So here's the question. Is Jesus enough? That's a big question, right? I, I have to ask that question of myself all the time because I'm like a boat on the ocean. And then I have to ask this question, is Jesus enough, right? Is he enough? You know, during this fast that we're involved in, many of us, hopefully, are involved in fasting something significant and meaningful within our lives as we move fast toward God, as we, during these 21 days, tell God, I, I love you more, I want you more, I need you more than this good thing that I'm giving up that I'm, that's very much a part of my life. I set that aside just to move fast toward you, right? But when you do that, you, you will perhaps notice that you are often confronted with your own obsessions and compulsions. And the restlessness in our own hearts is revealed. And we may hear the Holy Spirit calling us to find our total contentment in Jesus himself. You say, well, what does food have to do with contentment in Jesus? Or 
you know, this or that other thing. Well, a lot of times, you know, we, again, our compulsions and our obsessions and all this that, that drives us, when in a fast we set those things aside, it is often revealed how driven we are by other things and how much we need, have to absolutely need other things, although it's not, you know, we feel that, but it's just not, not essential to our lives. Fasting is meant to increase our awareness of our deep need and the great availability and all sufficiency of Jesus himself for us. Is Jesus enough? It's, it's just a huge question. Late, uh, earlier in, in the letter to the Philippians, he says this, do everything without grumbling or arguing. What? Now that's ridiculous. That's doing away with our American cultural Christianity pastime. Oh my goodness. Do everything without grumbling and arguing. Why? Because Jesus is enough. Amen? Because Jesus is enough. There's just this, uh, oh, I want to talk about this. I, yeah, I'm going to. <laughs> so, in the Old Testament, in Malachi, there's this, uh, if you know anything about the structure of the book of Malachi, it's the last book in the Old Testament, that it's kind of like a, a kind of like a court scene, right? There's, there's, uh, there's the, uh, accusation or the the indictment that God gives to the people and then the people raise the question and say what that's not us you know and like is that is, in there is that tithing thing you know why are you robbing me and they say we're not robbing you and he says yes you are you know by withholding the tithes and offerings you know he talks about that and that's the most famous one often quoted by by pastors and churches and leaders but here, here's this other one later on he says this you God says you have spoken arrogantly against me and, and, but they say, what? What have we ever said against you? <laughs> and he says, well, you have said this. You have said, it is futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant, but now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly evildoers prosper, and even when they put, their, put God to the test, they get away with it. So they were like saying, so what good is it to follow God, man? Because I know people aren't following God, and they're doing just fine, right? So it's like, it's futile to serve the Lord. That's, that was their conversation. God heard their conversation. God heard their complaining, right? Well, when God had, had said this, it, it says this. This is in Malachi chapter 3, verse 16 says this. Then those who, who reverence the Lord, they talk together with each other, and they begin to talk, talk together about, about this, what God was saying. And it says that the Lord listened and the Lord heard. The Lord listened on the conversation. By the way, he listens in on our conversations, right? He listens to the conversation of those who reverence the Lord and said, No, it is, it is worth it to follow Christ. It is the Lord. It is worth it to, to walk in obedience. It is worth it to say yes to him. It is worth it to give your whole life to him and to, and to just follow him with your whole heart. That's what they were saying. They were, they were those who feared the Lord, right? And he said, the Lord listened and heard, and a scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honored his name. And then God, God said, on the day when I act, these very ones here will be my treasured possession. I will spare them just as the Father's compassion and spares his own son who serves him. And you will see again the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. And to those who revere my name, later in chapter 4, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays, and you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves, and then you will trample down that which is evil, and, and um, they will be like ashes under your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. So he's just saying this, Lord, you know, we can so easily complain against God, because you know what? Most of the time, for many people who call themselves Christians, God is just simply not enough. Hence, our complaining. Hence, our discontentment. Hence, how easily we throw up our hands and give up when life gets hard. And I'm not making light of it. Life is really difficult. But in that difficulty is this Jesus who is enough. He is enough. 
Here's, here's, here's the third question, right? Do you know how to pray courage into existence? Do you know how to pray courage into existence? There, there are at least three times that prayer is mentioned in this, uh, in, in this little letter. Uh, one prayer is in, in chapter 1, verses 9, where Paul, verse 9 through 11, where Paul is praying for, for the people. As he is in prison, he's praying for others, which I think is just a marvelous thing. When in your prison you learn how to pray for other people, then something begins to happen in your own soul. Amen? And so he was praying, he prays this, I pr this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so you'll be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless on the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. I, be I bet you anything, that's what he prayed for himself. He knew how to pray that because he was praying that for himself, that his love would flourish, right? That their love would flourish and abound more and more in knowledge, depth of insight, They'd know what's best. Be blameless on the day of Jesus Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness. He prayed for them, right? They prayed for him. Chapter 1, verse 18 says, Yes, I will continue to rejoice, he says, even though he's in prison, even though things are not going well around him. For I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the, of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. He said, as you pray for me, man, by your prayers and by the Holy Spirit of God. Man, thank you. Thank you for, there's this mutuality. See, pray, pray courage into existence. And later, he encouraged them to pray. At the end of chapter, in the middle of chapter four, he says, pray, <laughs> pray instead of worry. Don't fret, don't worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praises shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. And before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good, will come in and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. It's powerful, isn't it? So it's this whole matter of just learn how to, we'll spend more time with it in the coming Sundays too, but learn how to pray courage into existence. It can happen. It can, see, prayer is not, I mean, when Jesus taught us the Lord's Prayer, he, he wasn't giving us a little ditty to say so we can kind of like get our prayers done with. He was really inviting us to speak something that brings heaven to earth, that causes us what God's will is, in heaven to happen on earth. So it is a big deal. And your prayers for others, for yourself, and you being willing to receive the prayers of others in your situations is a powerful reality when it comes to creating courage within your own life. Oh, I'll just give you this last one. This last question is this. Are you speaking about Jesus in your present circumstances? This is what Paul was doing. He was speaking about Jesus in the present circumstances. So in the midst of what was going on, in the difficulty, some don't, it, the, the goal here is don't shut down. Don't just shut down and shut up. Learn how out of that, you know, out of, you know, what is the purpose of your, your purpose in life? Right? You, you belong to him. As a follower of Christ, you're a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. You have confidence in Christ. Jesus is enough. You're learning this. You learn how to pray through your worries and your concerns and your fears. You're learning how to pray courage into existence. And in the midst of that, you are also open. Now, last weekend was a big weekend for college football. And Dab uh, uh, Dabo Sweeney, the, the Clemson coach, uh, was interviewed later after their big win of the national championship. But I love what he said as a follower of Christ. He said this, because there is hope for the future, there is power in the present. Because there is hope for the future, there is power in the present. And see, that's what you share. That's what you talk about. You talk, be real, be open, right? I'll just give you these things like, be open, share your journey. Don't go silent when it gets tough. Don't let others go silent. And if Jesus isn't in the conversation when you are talking about how you are doing, then a question needs to be raised. Where is he? Have you forgotten him? 
Remember, Jesus became flesh with us, and he's not moving out of the neighborhood. He's with us. So I think if you can answer these questions, and just kind of move into this, right? What is your purpose? Like, who do you belong to? You know, who, who holds the key to your, to, to, to your up or to your down, right? Is it just what's happening in the opinions around you? Or is it Jesus? Is Jesus enough? Is he enough? Right? Do you know how to pray courage into existence? You got to work through it. I mean, it's no, I mean, it's no like straight line. It's not like an easy path, but, you, but he's with you, right? And then as you're praying through all this and you're in conversation with him and with others, you, you, you share about your lively experience with Jesus in the midst of all the stuff that's going on. And, and Paul says this, when you do that, when you do that, the good news of Christ spreads to other places and populations, You don't even know what effect your witness of the reality of Christ in your present circumstances can have on someone and how far that effect will reach. And those who are also going through sufferings and difficulties will find courage also to speak about Christ and of their experience with Christ in the midst of their own difficulties because you are speaking of Christ in your difficulties. In our group life, we have these, we're just dogged about this. Where does Jesus make a difference for you? Because we are notorious for gaining information about Jesus with no discernible difference made in our lives. We hear the word and we rebel against it because we just either dismiss it or say it can't be so, when in fact our lives would be transformed by the real presence of a relationship with Jesus Christ. It is for us, right? So I have this question. This is the question right now. The question is this. They're kind of like your response. This is your RSVP, right? It is this. Yes, I will offer my circumstances to God as the place where I will boldly testify of the gospel of Jesus. You won't, but you won't just kind of slip into this. This has to be something intentional, as a response to Jesus. I will offer my circumstances to you, O God, as the place where I will boldly testify of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Praise the Lord. There's so much. Do you know that Philippians is called a letter of joy? Joy is mentioned so much. We're going to be touching on that in the next few weeks. But, but in the midst of all of this, we are to actually give praise and witness to the reality of Jesus in our lives. So it's not talking about a doctrine. It's not talking about a dogma. It's not like, you know, telling people what they ought to do or what they ought to know. It's simply bearing witness to how we are experiencing the resurrected Jesus in our own lives. And that, my friends, is the powerful way in which the good news of Christ is spread. Let's pray. Father, Dear God, thank you. You're just awesome. You're so, so, so faithful to us. You care deeply about where each one of us is. Some of us are, man, we're facing divorce. Some of us are facing, you know, uh, terminal illnesses. Some of us are going through really strained relationships. Some of us are struggling with addictions. Some of us are just wrestling over defeating thoughts with our minds constantly. We're, we're just always under a cloud. Some of us are, you know, wonder how many bad things can happen in a row. You know, some of us are fearful about the future. Some of us are just anxious about the present. Lord God, I just, I just, some of us are so regretful about the past that we can hardly know how to live into the future. God, I just want to ask you, help us to surrender to you today. Help us to say to you, Lord, God, I offer myself and my circumstances to you as the place from which I will 
experience you and speak boldly of you. Thank you, O Lord.